Are you tired of riding an emotional roller coaster every month? As a woman, I get it. The Women's Wheel is here to be your emotional anchor. Understand your cycle and discover the archetypes that resonate with your unique and dynamic emotional landscape. Together, let's find balance, strength, and a sense of ease through the changes. Head to womenswheel.co to start your journey of self-discovery and emotional empowerment today. Well, today I am lucky enough to have with me Margaret Baker. Uh, Margaret, I first met at an art market in Lakeland, the Lakeland Art Crawl. And um, before I actually met Margaret, a mutual friend of ours named Lucy told me I needed to be on the lookout for Margaret's work. And we happened to be neighbors. Uh, I ended up uh, buying a small piece from Margaret and commissioned her for four other small paintings. And uh, Margaret is probably my favorite painter in the Florida hey. area. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm also a dog sitting a Yorkie at this point, and that Yorkie loves to set off all the other dogs. Oh, so hopefully the noise canceling is going to tell and block some of that. Yeah. Anyways, well, um, Margaret has a wonderful style that is incredibly nostalgic and warm and like. Uh, I don't know this. I know this word doesn't make sense, but I like to describe your paintings as chewy. Uh, I just kind of want to like, I just want to like put it in my mouth and sink my teeth into it, like a uh, like a starburst. But they're they're warm. <laughs> like I, they're, they're definitely sentimentally warm. Like that's yeah. usually people are like these are really comforting. And um, when I have them all hung, like when they're all together, people are like these are really comforting. <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah. I guess I, guess they, I would they, say true because you have some, you usually have wide strokes, wide, fat strokes. And um, that makes it feel huggable, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. It, it's weird. But anyway, how would yeah. you go ahead? You describe your art for the listeners. Oh, that's always, that's always fun. Um, it's, <laughs> I, 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 most of the time I move fast. So yeah, my brush strokes when I'm, when I'm gathering something, it's, it's, they are pretty, pretty fat and looser. Um, although what's weird is when they're, you're far away, it looks tight to me. It always looks like more photo-ish than I want it to be. Then when I'm hanging it in my booth, I'm always like, oh, these are so messy. And, and then I'll step back to take a photo of my booth and I'll be like, oh, these, these look pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> but but my work is mo it's it's mostly nostalgia i started uh painting from references from uh, vernacular photography so found photos uh a lot of it comes from my own family family albums um i, I always tell people my dad left me about ten thousand slides uh like 25 uh seven moving boxes filled with 25 reels each wow. containing a hundred slides and I'm all from the 60s and 70s uh some from his childhood uh like uh, old photos and and old negatives and stuff he was a uh he was the the keeper of the family photos and um you know it he was annoying uh <laughs> and so a lot of the the photographs are these um unstaged moments that I like and when I start looking through them I didn't, it, it was, it was hard not to be instantly connected, but then it was like, I miss that. And so that's what I kind of try to portray in some of my paintings is, is sometimes it's that longing. Um, but I also paint a lot of found photos cause I used to collect old photos as well. So I look for stuff, you know, you can only paint your family for so long before you're just like, Oh, this is emotionally draining <laughs> and you move on. <laughs> So, yeah. so I, 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 I I've, also stuff. Just, I've also just finished uh, digitizing about a thousand slides from my mom's stuff um, because mm. uh, she's in a nursing home now. And um, so we had to severely like reduce the amount of clutter as we 
prepare to sell her house. And uh, digitizing all those slides with this little Kodak scanner thing I bought has been fun. But I think the most fun part is being able to throw them away afterwards. But I have them all in the cloud so she can view them on her tablet, which is nice. <laughs> yeah, my, my dad digitized a good chunk of these. And yet I can't find myself throwing them away because it, it feels like, uh, well, one, that because the negatives are uh, proof uh, you know, they're, they're, they're the originals and I just, they're just beautiful the way they are. You know, there's this weird, as I, like, I feel like I'm going to do something else with them when I'm done, mm. but when you come across these photos, cause it, people buy and sell these photos, you can go on eBay. You could, you could, instead of throwing away your old photos, you could literally could have sold them on eBay. Um, there's a lot of collectors of vernacular photography, um, people that have their own kink of things that they like, <laughs> and they literally are like, you know, sell, sell me stuff with, you know, vacation volcanoes in them or something. Um, so w what's that term you're using? Um, what photography? I don't want to say it wrong. Oh, uh, ver vernacular. So vernacular oh. is, is the amateur photography that we all do or did. I don't, I don't know if we all do it anymore because we can make really great photos with our digital phones. Um, but we're, you know, it's just, it's not a professional. It's a novice. And it's the type of stuff that makes its way to thrift stores and estate sales mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And you, it, it's it's got its own uniqueness, a lot of flash photography in there, uh, weird compositions. Um, you know, it's it's not well it's not well photographed, and that's kind of the beauty of it is because it caught that that hidden moment. So there's yeah. a lot of collectors of it. I've I've run across a lot of people who paint vernacular photography like I do. Um, and it's, so I, have, yeah. I have found a pretty good use of the ones that I scan because I'm working on a tarot project right now, which is uh, I'm kind of like I'm reinterpreting tarot cards to each be a fake Italian movie poster from the 70s. So mm -hmm. a lot of the photos were ones that my dad took in Italy in 1979. So those have taken uh, have it proved to be very useful as references. And yeah. uh, on top of that, I've also been using some other like um, photos from um, the British Museum and like public public stuff. But it's also been fun going back using photos that I took in high school. Like I'm like, oh, that perfectly works for this situation. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> weird, right? And and you people hold on to these photos. Um, I don't know. I the, I think the saddest is when I pick them up at thrift stores. You know, because you go to thrift stores, you always, and you find somebody's family photos and. And, you know, it's pretty, they're, they're dead. I mean, like the stuff that I'm painting, my son is not going to keep. It's going to make its way to Goodwill at some point um, mm. or the landfill. But I love that idea of taking something that is a thrown away moment, a moment that is lost. It is forgotten. It has been made its way to the edges of a thrift store. And now it becomes a oil painting. Um and somebody buys it and hangs it in their home and it's, you know, it's going to continue on for a while. Uh, I love that idea. I, and I love it when people, you know, buy something I've painted and I'm like, like I, I painted a series that was this, I, I picked it up at the coop, um, thrift store here in Orlando. And it was these black and white photos of this kid at a lake. And he was like, he's a fat little kid. And he had, a inner tube and he was like on the lake and it was like his it, you know it, it was two other women with him and there was pictures of him in the lake and then him by the shore and then him with his mom or his aunt or whatever and i painted a series i painted the almost the i, I bought four of the photographs and i painted three of them all three of them have sold mm -hmm. and i love this idea that this kid this lost you know he probably the, the person who's in that photo probably doesn't even remember the moment probably doesn't even remember the photograph, right? It was, you know, who knows? And, but, you know, now they're painted and somebody, somebody bought them and has hung them in their, in their home or office or something. It's kind of, I love that idea. It's like lost, yeah. but now found. I feel, I feel like your work is kind of the personification of an idea that I often come across, which is the more specific the imagery or concept, the more globally it becomes accepted. So, like, you're doing these incredibly specific moments, but people who grew up in the other side of the country will see that and identify with that. Is that something that you see, like, people 
looking at your work and then bringing up their own story that associates with it? Yes. Which is what I, it, which is when somebody comes in, cause I, um, I've had people who have, who've like beelined into my booth and, um, like I, I had this one that was, it was from a photograph of my mom and she was giving me a, um, like I, I'm a toddler and you can't really see me. I'm just like leaned over in the sink. And I had this woman beeline into my tent and she was crying. And, you mm. know, it was one of those situations where <laughs> it was like, she recognized that mom moment. Like, I feel like I paint a lot of mom moments and it just, it kind of made her emotional because she, she had just lost her mom um, in mm. the past. And I get a lot of those, like people who are just instantly like, or I get people who are like, that looks exactly like my uncle, such and such, or that looks, that's my uncle on that ugly couch with the dogs <laughs> on the couch, you know, um, which, which is fun, but I love it when people, because no matter what your work is, people are going to make up their own stories about it. Um, mm. you know, I can, I can wax poetic all day about my own painting <laughs> and like my motivation behind it, but it really doesn't matter. It's what somebody, you know, but they see it and they see something else. Like I've, I've had people, um, I usually can tell the kind of area I'm in when they, you know, by the artist they compare me to. So <laughs> hmm. like, I'll take it. I'll take whatever artist you got, but it's, you know, their, their vocabulary of relating. And so, yeah, I love that they, people make I, up stories. I, I would say first and foremost, I equate your style with Edward Hopper. Um, oh, that's is sweet. that something you've heard? You know, uh, if, okay, <laughs> I don't, I don't want to get myself in trouble. If I'm okay. <laughs> if I'm in an area like I've, cause I've, I've, only been doing these shows for, I guess the last five years um, but like in the last couple of years I've done more of them outside of um, all around and if I'm in like a college town um, I get bigger I get bigger comparisons so I get like Edward Hopper or um, oh, I can't remember who they compare me to but it was like you know actual artists where I'm like oh that's really cool thank you very much but a lot of the times I get um and and this is this is going to be the more like not near college towns. I'll get Norman Rockwell, which is not mm. my style, but right. I don't. The reason I know that they, you know, from from just a like layman, the reason that that's the the artist that comes to mind is because it's just it's homey, and it's mm -hmm. relatable. So he painted homey and relatable things. Um, you know, as an artist, you always like you, you know the artist that you want people to say. Like mm. if you had said, and I had this happen to me, I was in at a show in Tennessee and there was another artist across from me and she was an art teacher and she came over and she goes, and of uh, Alice Neal. And I was like, oh, oh you wow. hit the artist that I wanted somebody to compare me to. Like, <laughs> I was like, I got, I got really excited. I was like, that's the first time anybody ever like name the artist that I really like. <laughs> you know, it's, it was kind of, it was kind of sweet. <laughs> if you had said Mary Cassatt uh -huh. too, I would have loved that. So, <laughs> Oh yes. Yes. Picturing yeah. a child in a park in yeah, Paris or, or yeah. sitting in a chair or something. Yeah. yeah. So uh, l let's talk a bit about your journey at market. So like, where did you start? How far have you gone? Cause you mentioned you did one in Tennessee and I know you're headquartered in the Orlando Gainesville area, if I'm not mistaken, I'm, I mean, you've been doing I'm it for in, five uh, years. So. Yeah, I'm in Orlando. I have my um, <laughs> this last year, uh, last November, I I now have a studio in Lake Mary, so I'm really proud of that. I've had that, and we just signed a, a two year additional lease, so I'm here for a while. Um, so that's where I'm based out of. But the first show I ever did was Art Crawl um, out of oh. Lakeland. So it was the one that was uh, when they were, they just moved. I haven't, I haven't seen the, the new location, but the, I think it was 2018 I did. That was my very first show and it was the one day show. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I had a, the white pop-up tent. Um, I had the mesh walls, the white mesh walls. I spent money on those. Um, so my, like my initial setup was probably about $700, um, expense wise. Okay. 
And my whole thought process <laughs> was if I can set up the tent, like I could care less whether anybody bought anything or, or whatever. All I want to know was, could I set up that tent and put those walls up by myself? And I did. <laughs> and I like, I didn't sell anything at art crawl 2018. And I was so, I was ecstatic. I was driving home. Like I set it up and I broke it down all by myself. <laughs> you know? Like I was so proud of myself. Um, did you do any you know, practice so in your I'd, backyard? I did. I set it up in my driveway. Yeah. Okay. So it was, it was, um, yeah, I was, I mean, it was, I, it, it was embarrassing how proud I was. Cause I think I only had like eight paintings. Like I had eight paintings. That was, that was it. Like, um, and I think the next year, like our crawl in their application, they're like, you need to have enough work to fill the tent. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I felt, I felt targeted. I felt <laughs> <laughs> but they did such a good job because you didn't have you know like to apply when you apply to art show, art festivals you almost always have to have a booth shot and it has to be a quality booth shot and that's really hard to do um when you're just wanting to see if that's even something that's viable so like right. the whole premise of art crawl it being one day and it being um supported by the Polk Museum of Art and the um Ellen Chastain, who runs it, I mean, just so supportive of the artist. You didn't have to have a booth. You didn't have to have a booth shot. Um, and they actually took booth shots that year. I don't know if they still do all this, but they oh. literally took photographs of the artists in their booth. So you could use that as a booth shot. Like they would take a picture of your booth for you. Um, and they did so much promotional material um, that like other stuff came from that. Like I didn't sell anything at that festival, but I met, like I met connections that led somewhere um, in the future and have led, have continued actually to lead somewhere. Like I, I've been contacted by people who was like, I saw you at art crawl. Um, and you know, I'm at a different festival and they're like, I want to buy, buy your work. So that's, that's always awesome. So that was, I guess, uh, I assume art crawl was in November again uh, in 2018. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So it, so you started pretty late in the year with that first market. How how would you estimate? And I ask because it's, I know I have kind of my own journey. Uh, how would you estimate, say, 2019? How many markets you did, and then how did that compare to 2020? So 2019, I probably okay. So I did. I did, I think in 2018, I did art crawl and I also did, uh, where, where I live had a uh, winter Springs art festival again, sold zero dollars <laughs> work. <laughs> so it's, it's always, you know, keep going though. And, uh, so 2019, I don't remember probably about five, five festivals. I didn't do anything. Like I was so proud of, I got into, um, images. So when, you know, when you, you do art festivals, you, a lot of times you needed to apply for an art festival six months ago. Like you want right. to be in the art festival, you need it. And so like that was the other thing with art crawl is like, um, it was something I was trying and you, it, there was like a two month, like it was like a month and a half or something you apply and then you find out and then you, you go. Um, and I think I did the next shows that it was like a big show that for me, it was images in new Smyrna beach. Uh, it's put on by the Atlantic Center for the Arts. It's in January. I'll be doing it this year as well. And that one was like, what I feel like my first really big, like, ooh, like a big art show. It was three days. Um, I had to set everything up myself. Uh, I had my big, oh, wait, no. After Art Crawl, I'm sorry. I, after Art Crawl, I did Land, the Land Art Festival, because that one's also in November. <laughs> later in the year it's right before thanksgiving i did deland that was the big that was my first big art festival like where i felt like it was like a real art festival with like other artists um and professional artists you know people who do this for a living um that would be deland like i was that was that was one i was really proud of it was also the one where i realized i needed to get a better tent because it rained and the i had like an easy up tent or ABC canopy and the tent had like bowed with the water mm. and you like, they, there are people, you can put like cool noodles or something in there to get the water out. But I was like, I'm going to keep doing this. And, you know, even though I, I think that 
the land show, I maybe sold a thousand dollars of paintings, not a, like a lot. Um, I made expenses and a tiny profit. Um, I was like, I'm going to keep going. And so I bought a, like the professional tent. So I bought the big trim line tent, which was a lifesaver. And then the next, like right after that. So I think in 2019, I did like five shows. Um, it was enough to keep me going. And then in 2020, I did uh, images and I won an award and I did Mount Dora and I won an award and then COVID hit and I didn't do anything till 2022 when we met at uh, our crawl again in yeah. uh, November, 2022. So or was that one November thing I 2021? Was... No, it was 2021. I, we I met. think it was, yeah, it was yeah. 21. So uh, one thing I specifically want to ask you about is you made the delineation of like a professional art market. And I know that those exist out there. Art crawl is the most art centered event I've ever vented at. I always do more market markets rather than art markets generally. Right. Cause I feel like the audiences that go to those are not going to be interested in what I make. Cause I don't do anything traditional. I'm all digital. I'm primarily make products with my art. And also usually the vending fees are like three, $400 for events like that. But it seems like yeah. that's where you've been focusing on is those more high end. Well, um, it's, it's the same. Maybe high end is not the term, but yeah. I, well, no, I, um, so whenever I apply, um, and, and this is just something to, to know is you always feel like you're sending, you're sending out, I'm buying the worst lottery ticket ever is what I'm doing. I'm spending <laughs> 50 bucks <laughs> and it's a lottery ticket. Like, are you going to get into the show? Like, cause there's a lot of work involved, mm -hmm. but the reason I kept going, um, and the reason I saw doing those types of art festivals for myself, like art, like, uh, ones that focus on, on fine art or just, you know, people who, who make art, um, and not necessarily products, right. Mm -hmm. They were making paintings or, or, or ceramics and photos and stuff like that. Um, the reason I focus on that is because what I found, even when I didn't sell anything, is that I got a really good glimpse of my target market. And when, you know, that, that idea, like I made this painting, I'm going to put it online. Everybody's going to love this. I'm going to sell this. That doesn't happen. And even if you have a great following on Instagram, you know, people are following you all the time. You can post work. You may, you are not really knowing the people who are really attracted to your work. And when you're out there in front of the people and actually, hear, I mean, yeah, you hear a lot of stupid comments, <laughs> you know, comments where you're like, you got to let it roll over you. But mm -hmm. you also get some really great insight about the type of people who are drawn, like that literally come into your, your booth and are like, or even for products, like, I, I love this coloring book. I love, I love the golden girls. I mean that you, you mm -hmm. have to get that. Yeah. Everybody. So when you're like, I, 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 that's invaluable information. And right. so that's what's kept me doing the markets or the, the festivals and why I kept applying even when I didn't make any money. Um, but it's, you know, it's a different, I, I, I sell paintings, I sell oil paintings, you know, and mm -hmm. every market's different. So like whenever I go out to, um, like somebody tells me, oh, you need to apply to this show. This is a really great show. The first thing I'm going to want to know is like, what do you sell? Like your great show is not my great show. <laughs> mm, good point. Good and point, like, yeah. yeah, your great location. And, and so like, I, like the thing I learned about Delan, like when the first year when I did Delan festival, I was like, it was the first time I actually sold paintings. Like people actually bought multiple paintings and I got a good idea of like, okay, so the people who kind of are attracted to my artwork are between this age range. A lot of them, um, like I, I do better in like college type towns. Um, or, or larger type art fe or festivals that are put on by arts organizations like um, the Atlantic Center for the Arts sort of thing. Like I, I do better with those than I do going to some of the other festivals which are put on by maybe different types and they're looking for different types of work. Um, yeah, so it's, it's I really like it. I, I, I shouldn't like it. It's really hard and it's really expensive. <laughs> And again, it's like you're like, I just apply, I've, I'm applying for the summer right now. Mm. So I, I'm applying to the summer to outside of Florida shows. 
And it's a crapshoot. I have no idea what kind of shows I'm going to get into. I have no idea if my business is going to continue past April. <laughs> <laughs> like I have shows, um, I have good shows up up until uh, almost May, and then I have no idea what the, my rest of my year looks like. Um, and if you're a Florida, if you strictly do Florida, you pretty much have the summer off, and then you right. start applying towards you, in the summer. In the summer is when you're applying towards those those uh, fall shows. Or if you're trying to apply to something that's really big, like the Winter Park Art Festival, that's when you're applying in like August, you're applying for that March show. I mean, like a lot of these like really big shows that are, they are very expensive. They have really long lead times and you have no idea if you're going to get in because the judges are always different. It's really high stakes. There's a lot of people applying. And so sometimes just getting in is like, you know, that's where you celebrate even though you have no money in your pocket. <laughs> yeah. So, so w one thing that I, uh, uh, I guess I could say get addicted to. So like markets are a n not a big percentage of my business income, but one thing that I always get addicted to is like coming home after a long day at a market, $1,400 richer. And you're like, well, that was nice for one day's work. <laughs> so I, I, I definitely feel that like draw and need to want to apply for more things, but I've uh, over the years started editing out markets from my schedule. Do you find that each year you apply to more or you apply to less? So this year, um, so if you were to ask me last year, last year, this time last year, I would have said that I was trying to only do uh, no more than eight shows a year. Okay. And that changed when I did um, a couple shows outside of Florida in the summer. And it was kind of a fluke that I even applied to him. It was, it was like, an, I don't even know how the hell I got accepted, but it was so such a great experience that this year I flipped it and I'm actually trying to stay busy and do more markets or more, more festivals um, during the spring and summer and not do any in the fall. So mm. um, that said, I've also edited out some of the festivals that I've done in the past that have just been, they're the ones locally that are big festivals. I, I you know, being on the I-4 corridor um, and in central Florida, we are really positioned to have a lot of great shows. Like there's a lot of shows down in St. Pete where you are and a lot of shows in Tampa, a lot of shows um, in the central Florida area up and down the I-4 corridor, a lot of big name shows. And like, I, I just had to say, I don't have the ability to do, uh, and the one I just turned down, um, uh, was Mount Dora. And I was like, I don't, I, I do, I'm doing images at the end of Jan or January. And then like Mount Dora is like always the next weekend. Mm -hmm. And that's always such a stretch for me because I, what I make is painting. So if I, if I didn't make a, a lot of paintings, um, it's, a, I can't like just make an oil painting. It won't even be dry by the time So it's right. like inventory wise. And I was like, you know, I don't know why I'm stressed. So instead I started to focus on just quality. So, so when I'm you try not market, to do, you, do you bring everything you have or do you leave some stuff I, back? I, so this year I will be bringing, I'm not bringing the same. Um, I have a couple large paintings that I probably won't be taking. But I had this really unique experience where um, this last July, I took everything I had to Colorado and I sold out just about everything I had except for these three oh, paintings. Oh, wow. wow. So that was like, that was like really, that was awesome. That was the, like, like I said, that was a show that I, I couldn't even believe I got into. Um, and it made me realize like, okay, instead of trying to focus on maybe some of the small, like the, the ones that are local to me. I should aim to maybe try to go for the bigger shows that are outside of Florida. And, you know, if you get in, you, you get in, otherwise you just donated 50 bucks, you know, your application fee to these, this organization, but it's, it was definitely worth my time. And it, it, at first I thought it was maybe a fluke. And then I did another one outside of Florida and Tennessee. And that one was really great. Um, I was like, that was one I took Louis, um, Lucy came with me to help. And I was like, this turned out to be kind of profitable. 
<laughs> so that that was that was nice. You know, that, that was a nice feeling, and it it, it kind of solidified my my business. I'm like, oh, you know what? I'm going to whittle down some of the more regional ones that I've been doing and maybe look at, so I started looking at some of the really big shows and going, I'm going to throw the dice and see if I get in. And if I get in great, if I don't, then I'm out 50 bucks, but do you find supporting some organization? Are you ready to paint your own canvas in the real estate world as a homeowner? It's Leslie Haas from Realty One Group Sunshine, and I'm here to talk home equity, your masterpiece in the housing market. Imagine owning a piece of property that's not just a place to call yours, but also an investment opportunity. It's time to take that brush and start creating equity in your dream home. With interest rates on the verge of dropping, get ahead of the curve and secure your artistic haven before the next rush. Whether you're a first-time home buyer or upgrading your studio, let's sketch out your home ownership dreams together. To learn more, visit Tampa Bay Homes for Sale dot real estate. Do you find that your target demographic is different in different regions? Like, for example, you mentioned you do a lot of like college town things here in Florida. You find that there's people um, interested in buying your work. Do you see like in Tennessee and Colorado, it was the same type of people buying stuff or was it like maybe well, older people who have like nostalgia for their childhood versus their oh parents' gosh, childhood. No. Actually, you know, no, I, my demographic is not older people. Um, it's actually, it's younger, uh, younger than me. So there's, I call it a collective nostalgia, mm. um, uh, is how I describe it is that, uh, like the, the, a lot of the stuff that I work off of is stuff from the seventies as sixties, seventies, uh, you know, sometimes it's earlier, like forties and fifties, but it's that time period that's just on the cusp of like analog, you know, it's, it, everything was still analog. And then, you know, before digital started to come in and I feel because everything's digital now, this is how I'm explaining it to myself, like explaining the people who buy my stuff is it just feels like there's this collective nostalgia for when things were analog. Even though like mm-hmm. they couldn't, they, they don't have a connection to these photographs. So I really have like the person who, who buys the work goes, I, I bought it because it's my, you know, reminds me of my family. It'll remind them of something or they feel a connection to it. But like some of the younger people that buy my work, um, I think it's just like a memory. It's like a nostalgia for something that when it was slower or whatever, um, mm-hmm. you know, it's not, things weren't moving as fast. So but you, you the, say from region so you, from region to region. I've only done a couple outside of Florida and two different types of demographic. Um, the one area I did very wealthy area, <laughs> <laughs> so that was a different demographic. But for the most part, I rarely have older people buying my work. Like I don't. Hmm. I, I'll have people commission me for an older person. That's like oh, that's this is going to be a present for grandma. Or this is going to be a present for my mom or something like that. So if I do a custom piece, um, that's usually the case. Uh, but for the most part, like if I'm, if I just painted something cause I wanted to paint something, it's usually people my age or younger by my work. So, so let's, under 50. let's move into a conversation then about commissions. Twiggy wants to ask you a question. It's my dog. <laughs> so let's move into a conversation about commissions. Looking at your business as a whole, what percentage of income would you say is commission based? It it depends. I, I think I told you it was about thirty percent, thirty five percent of my business is commissions. Like <laughs> right now, I, I'm not in any galleries. Um I sell primarily at these festivals. Like that's and I and a reason I like that is because you're like the people who buy from me are buying directly from the artist. And so I actually get to meet the people and I get to learn about my people who are attracted to my work and I get immediate feedback um, on my work, which can be invaluable. And a lot of times just getting out there with my artwork, even when I don't sell anything turns into something down the road. Um, But commissioned wise, I, I, probably hand out 500 cards at a festival and if i hear i will hear from somebody probably um i don't know i i might hear from somebody a year later 
Sometimes I hear from him immediately. Um, sometimes it'll be that same person saw me, sees me again at a festival at a different festival, same person who picked up a card and they're like, Oh, I remember you. I need to contact you. Then they reach back out to me. Um, so and that, you know, it's, I try not to do too many. Like I think when I first started, I did a lot more commissions because I felt like I needed to sell art. And so it's mm -hmm. really easy to say yes. Um, yes to everything. Um, so, you know, Hey, can you paint my dog? Yes. <laughs> hey, can you paint my, you paint my mom? Yes. Uh, you know, it was a lot of yeses and 20, I think 2022, not tw or was it 2023? Uh, I can't remember. I think it was 2022 is I had to start saying no, mm. um, because I wasn't enjoying it. It's there. Sometimes it can be somewhat, you know, you, you may get something from someone and, you know, you go back and forth on commissions and you, it's not gelling. It's, it's not, it's not going to be an enjoyable experience. Sure. And that's, that's been a really big learn. Like I, I had one where I did this commission and I wasn't feeling it like at all. I was like, this is going to be a stretch, but it was a good amount of money. So I was like, oh, okay, this is a good chunk of change. And the client she was very pushy. Like, you know, she would just like, it was morphing into something I really didn't want to paint. And it ended up with me just returning her deposit, which I, you know, I say it's non-refundable and, but I'm like, I don't want to work on this. And it, that was a, that was a really strong realization of like, Oh, it's a good amount of money. I don't want to do this. <laughs> mm. This is not going to work out well. Like neither of us are going to be happy. Um, like she was sending me pictures of her, like it was a picture in that, like, mm -hmm. oh, hey, sorry. Um, and then she started sending me like their school book, their school year pictures from the seventies. Like I could paint in their faces from these photographs and <laughs> I have some skills, but I don't, I don't have that kind of skills. <laughs> um, I don't, I don't do a lot of digital manipulation. Um, sure. I should learn that. And so, yeah. So commissions are, you know, yours, yours were great. Your commissions were great. And they're actually <laughs> one of my favorites um, oh. because you, you also had such great photographs, but they were, you know, they were taken with such love and, you know, they were fun. Like you, you were like, Oh, I want them to be on that paper. And that was, that was my jam. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. It, <laughs> it took us um, at least a year before we could hang them up because one of the dogs passed in between me yeah. asking you to paint it and us getting them. And like, he wasn't even sick when I asked you to paint them. So it was very fast. Um, and so it just, it took a while before we were ready to hang those up and see all the dogs together on the wall. Yeah. <laughs> it's, that's, that is whenever I'm doing pet portraits, there's only been a few yours. And then I was, I, I gotta tell you, like when you were like, yeah, the dog, cause I, I think I'd started, I, I, I was almost done with them and they were about ready to, I was ready to ship them to you. And I'm like, yeah, the dog passed. And I was like, I was kind of excited that I was finally painting animals that no, that were not gone. <laughs> so I feel like a lot of times I'm, I'm painting, I'm painting the deceased. And, um, I always, I always feel bad about that a little bit. Um, like I, I just painted this and I'm, I really loved it and I'm glad the client loved it. And it was one that was my jam. Um, it was, it was just like, I loved, I loved everything about it. It was like from the nineties, this photo, but the two people in the photos both had died you know, they, they had passed. It was a, it was a painting for his mom. And so I knew it was going to be emotional, um, uh, with the, with the painting. And that often makes it harder because you're wanting to capture that essence, uh, that they feel about the person, um, mm -hmm. or the dog or, or whatever that there's a lot of pressure <laughs> for doing <laughs> that. So I'm glad I captured it. And then, you know, and I'm sorry to that the dog passed, but it was, I liked your project. And so I'm glad. I'm, glad. I'm sorry they made you cry. <laughs> so uh, in regards to these clients, are do you almost always find them at these um, art fairs and art markets? Or do you get leads through your website or Facebook? Or I, what does yeah, usually no, happen? The only, yeah, the only leads I get through my website are scammers. Um, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, it's the same scam. No, my, my website is kind of just a landing page. Um, I've had people that have reached out to me who've seen my stuff on Instagram. Um, hmm. but 
the reason that they even made their way to Instagram is because they saw me at a festival or right. okay. somebody I had one. Um, and this is, this is why I like doing the festivals is I'll have people like I had a gentleman, this was a couple of years ago who just kind of reached out through email and, uh, was like, I, you know, can you paint this picture of my wife and, and, and her dog? Both of them were alive. And <laughs> he's like, it's a birthday <laughs> present. And, you know, he paid me my deposit and I'm like, okay, so I, I, I get it painted. And I never followed up with him. Like, where did you hear about me? I, I just assumed he probably saw me at a festival and it, and then this woman was like, you painted this painting for my friend, Mike. I gave him your card. I picked it up like a couple of years ago at a festival and I gave it to him. <laughs> and, you know, he reached out to you to, to do the painting. He loves that painting. And I'm like, that's amazing. You know, like he didn't mm -hmm. even see my work in person. It was just like somebody thought enough when they saw my work and was like, I'm going to pass this on to people I know. I'm going to take your cards and pass awesome. them on. I, I almost never get anything off of Facebook. <laughs> I like my Instagram is linked to my Facebook um, and I keep it there. Like, you know, some people who like try to friend me, they're actually just looking for my face. So I leave it open. Um, but my website, I pretty much just have as a landing page so you can find my about, you can find mm. my CV, you can find, you know, recent artwork that literally comes from Instagram. I've linked my Instagram to my, my website. So if you're looking at the recent pictures, they're going to be the same ones from Instagram. Uh, so do you have a personal it. Instagram or just a business Instagram? I have so many Instagrams. Um, <laughs> so, uh, when my, I have one that is one where I just post, um, I post photos of, uh, my family. So after my parents died, it was pretty hard. And so I, I, I posted our stories. So that, that's a weird one that I have. And then I, um, I post, I used to post for a lot of different companies. So I would help out like other, like little nonprofits and stuff and I would help them post. But right now the only one I have is, um, the Margaret Baker art Instagram and, um, family remains, which is where I mm. post about our family, like our, like, our, you know, my, my dead family, <laughs> my mom and my dad, my, my brother. So yeah. I, I find myself using Instagram less and less as time goes on. And I find myself using TikTok more and more because I try to replicate what I do as a consumer. And as a consumer, I find myself rarely scrolling through Facebook or TikTok anymore, but I scroll through TikTok a lot. Yeah, I, I think it's, I don't have TikTok, all right? But yeah. when I scroll on Instagram, I'm watching, t I'm, you know, I'm like, I'm watching TikTok videos. Like it's so, <laughs> it's so dumb, you know, that like, I'm like, yeah, I don't have TikTok, but I wait for the week later and I'm scrolling, you know, I'm still watching the same TikTok creators. Mm -hmm. um, I don't do that. I used to try to post like, I think five years, five or six years ago when I started this, like I was trying to build a following. Like, you know, you feel like you have to mm -hmm. build a, like that was a right, thing. Oh, yeah. you have to build a following. Oh, you have to post like, you know, on a schedule. And I even took Instagram classes, which is why I helped out some of like small businesses that I knew um, with their Instagram, their social media, because I'd taken these, these classes. I don't use it on my own. Um, I find every time I do a festival, uh, my Instagram bumps. Uh, mm. because people follow me from the festival. Um, and that's actually been a little bit better than, well, a lot better than Instagram. So like I made the mistake of paying for advertising once like a year or two ago from by Instagram, that's certain death. Like you pay for, if you paid for, uh, advertising Instagram and you don't continue to pay for advertising, uh, Instagram will just strangle your account. You might as well just give up and start over. And yeah. so now my posts every once in a while, they'll like get seen by more than 8% of my followers. But most of the time, you know, I'm, I, they're strangling my account. Like, I think they were like, Oh, you're going to enjoy these couple hundred likes of this, this picture. But that's it. That's it. That's all you get. So now I don't, I don't post on Instagram. I feel like post like when I feel like it or if I'm doing an event. So I post, I use stories more on Instagram. I've thought about I know, like, setting up a store, but I, I just, I haven't done that either. Yeah. I know in general, I feel like, so thinking about how my wife uses Instagram, 
we pass by a restaurant that looks interesting, her first thing she does is look them up on Instagram to see like mm. what kind of events they're happening, uh, how recently they've posted. That way she'll know how active they are in like social settings. Yeah. And like, Based on that, it makes me think that I should be having a post every time I'm going to be at a market, every time I'm working on something, I should do that on Instagram. But the problem is, I don't think anyone who follows me cares. Like, no one wants to see what I'm doing as, like, an an active yeah. traveling person. It might make sense for you when you're going to a lot I, more markets. Well, n no, I don't post about, like, this is the life of, like, there. I, I literally <laughs> now, because I linked my Instagram to my website, and it's so, because it was so cumbersome to load, like, photos onto my website of, like, recent artworks or whatever. So mm -hmm. that linking between Instagram and there. So then I, what I used to do is I used to put post, like, work in progress, or like, you know, here's how my studio looks today. Like those little snippets of life. I don't do that anymore. I just post finished po paintings because I know it's going to go to my website. Um, and then in my stories, I always make sure to have my upcoming events. Mm. It drives me. I, it irritates me to know it's like posting that somebody died and didn't, and don't, and you don't put like what they died from. Cause now I'm going to spend 20 minutes looking up, like, what did they die from? So people will post like their event, but they don't say like where the event is or when the event is and like <laughs> artists that I follow. And I'm like, I want to go see your artwork. Where are you? And they'll just post like, I'm going to be at this place. And they don't like put the city um, or the time or the day. <laughs> and I, I'm always irritated. I'm like, why did, why are you being so exclusive? Like, I just want to, you know, it's an event. So I got in the habit of, I always post my events. Like I'll, in my stories, I'll post like, I am in, I am in booth 182 on Canal Street, you know, in New Smyrna Beach. And you know, the weird thing that's happened, people have come to see me and they'll say, I follow you on Instagram and you posted oh. where you were going to be. And they show up, they don't buy anything, but they showed up, you know, just to tell me that they were <laughs> mm -hmm. like, oh, I didn't even know about this event, but I saw you posted it and you posted where it was, where your booth was, where it was near, <laughs> what wow. day in the time of the event. And it was like those silly, stupid things. I was like, oh yeah, that's really helpful, isn't it? To know where I am. So I do that. I do hmm. that religiously in stories, but that's it. It's good to see that feedback. I, I honestly don't know how Instagram stories work. I don't think I've ever posted a story. I've shared stories that I've been tagged in, but I, I'm i just, I, I mean, I'm sure it's easy to well, figure you out. Do, you, do tic, you do TikTok, so you can post your TikToks to stories. That's all they oh, are. Oh, shit. That's a good idea. Yeah. You just post those. But the other is like, the, the reason, I, I mean, it's kind of old now. I mean, I'm, it, we're talking about something that was five years ago and I feel like there's always a new social media and there's always a new thing you know like mm -hmm. you, you know like everybody's moved over to this other thing and if you're like I have a Facebook which really right there tells you that I must be close to 50 because I have a Facebook <laughs> nobody like my son will not have a Facebook that's just insane um you know he won't even have an Instagram I'm sure in the future he's 10 he'll not have any of that um it, it always feels somewhat outdated like posting to the like any advice that you had from uh, last year is going to be outdated today so i just try to keep it current like you say because i do the same thing i'll find artists that i like and i'll go to see are you even still active are you still alive um and i'll look at like okay he posts once every month or so and i'm like okay he's still alive um he's busy um i try to post once a week but like those weird things of trying to keep a schedule on instagram no I don't do that anymore, but I do post my stories. And if I actually know that those process videos you were talking about, like, you know, the things like where you're making your art, I feel like those are, unless you're wanting a bunch of artists following you, um, those are great for stories, like just giving context. So I know, I, like I follow people who pro post mm -hmm. their process. I know that's a, that's a huge thing on TikTok. Um, I, for a long time was doing like time lapse of my watercolors. And then I realized that like the videos that do better on TikTok are not time lapse. It's just like three seconds every ten minutes of your painting, so that it feels like you're 
like you're not doing it quickly. It's still at the normal rate, but it's just edited down really fast. Oh, and, and do and you that, cut off right before the for the end so that like the person has to watch it all the way through <laughs> again? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but like I haven't done that because it's like thinking of logistically how I'm going to do that. Am I going to record the whole thing as like like a two hour watercolor painting and then actually edit it down on the computer? Or do I just like every few seconds pull out the camera and record another three seconds? If I do it all as time lapse, it's a lot easier because then I have the thing done at the end. It's just tedious. Yeah, <laughs> it is really tedious, isn't it? Though, like I've tried. Yeah. I think when I first started, I did. Yeah, like you can if you scroll my Instagram. If I haven't hidden them, I I'll have like a video that I posted of me like painting, and I had like the setup on my phone, you know, all set up and <laughs> another camera, and. I was like, this is not what I want to do. Um, I love that experience where you don't know what you don't want until you're actually in it. And you're like, oh, I don't want this. <laughs> and that was one of the, like, I've already, I've already spent the money on, you know, this, this thing that holds my phone, you know, for the tripod. And I've already spent the money on the ring lamp and, you know, and then I do it and I'm like, oh, I don't, I don't want all this. Like, I can't, I can't maintain this. And what I also noticed with some of the festival artists is that they don't even, they don't even maintain, um, art web. Like they, they literally don't have any social media, which always, that, that, that like blew my mind. They didn't have any social media because they're, they're not looking to sell their work from social media. They're looking to sell it in person. Mm -hmm. And, um, the show that I did in Denver, that was a huge show. And I, that was the first time I've ever met people who made enough money. Like they only do four shows a year. That was one of them. And like wow. when they were leaving, they were leaving with a huge chunk of change. Um, wow. They were like this, like I met one woman from Brooklyn and she's like, I, she's like, I only do four shows. This is one of them. And I, this is like, you know, one fourth of my income for the year. Okay. And she's like, I fly in, I rent a van, I bring, you know, bring my artwork, I rent a tent. I set up for the show. It's a three day show. And she's like, that's, that's, and when she left the festivals, she left a lot more money than me. Like there was just people where I'm like, I cannot believe the sales um, because there are people, this is their full-time job. Their mm -hmm. full-time job is just doing these festivals around the country and they are making six figures easily. I mean, if, if that, if I ever, if I, I will never get into that Denver show again, but if I ever do, uh, I will bring more artwork. <laughs> that is, that is the, the trajectory that you're trying to model your, yourself after, right? Like that is kind oh, of your yeah. ultimate goal is to just be yeah. market focused or festival Pretty much focused. These, the, the festival focused, like while I physically still can, like it's not mm -hmm. a thing because you're, you're battling the weather. It can suck. It can suck. And and I've driven home from shows where you don't sell very much and the weather was awful and you're you're driving with the music off and you're just dead eye stare as you're driving home, you know, thinking about your life choices. And then there'll be the time <laughs> where you like, you know, like you said, you go home with fourteen hundred bucks and you're like, Hey, that was that was a really easy day. Um yeah. that was really enjoyable. I enjoy having money in my bank account. Um yeah, it's it. There's the inconsistency of it, you know, because you don't know how a show's going to go. And actually, you know, as like the pandemic, you don't even know if the show's going to go off. Like I had applied in 2020, it was going to be the year that I was supposed to go to Nashville. I had gotten into Madison, Wisconsin show, which is which is a really hard one to get into. I had gotten into one in Minnesota. Those were all ones that were going to take place in 2020. They all got canceled because of COVID, mm -hmm. um, and riots. Uh, but you know, like COVID, they, everything got canceled. But like, I have a show coming up uh, that's over by the beach in New Smyrna. The weather could be awful. Like it, it could be cold. Like if it's cold, I'm probably not going to be a lot of people. Or if it's really windy, uh, they might cancel the show. Uh, so like you could be, I could be making, like right now I'm making a bunch of artwork for the next five shows that I have coming up. And they're all kind of big shows. So I'm hoping I do well at them. But the reality is it could get closer and that show could get canceled. Um, mm -hmm. Or it the the weather might just be bad, right? So if it's overly hot, people won't come out. Um, you know, I've, I've been at a show where there was flooding. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's not pleasant. 
And so, yeah, I'm focusing, I am selling my, like putting my, like, that's the, the focus I see for my business. Sorry <laughs> for the it's next, okay. enjoy, enjoy that. Um, <laughs> for the next year is festivals. I don't know, you know, cause it, if you, even if I get sick, it's not setting up a tent is hard. Um, mm, hanging, yeah. you know, dragging all your artwork. I, I fill up my car with artwork. I, I drive a SUV. I fill it up with artwork in my tent and I set everything up myself, uh, which I'm always proud of myself um, to do. Yeah. There's always some guy. There's always some guy at the end who's like, "Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, you needed some help," and I'm like, "No, I got it now. <laughs> Thank you." <laughs> I know what you mean. I, uh, I've passed out at a market before, and uh, luckily it was like ten minutes from home, so my wife came and saved my life. But <laughs> oh, there, there, just... I think there's literally been artists that have died. Um, Wow. You know, doing a festival that because it's so it's so yeah, hot, it. but yeah. Well, for but me, like when it I, was just because I wasn't hungry all day, so I'm like, oh, maybe tomorrow I'll weigh a few pounds less. That'll be fun. It's stupid. Oh so yeah. I just no. didn't eat. <laughs> I did that where uh, this winter. Th there's the one down in St. Pete Main Sale um, that's over in Vinoy Park. <laughs> yeah. That one's at the end of the season in Florida, so it's like mid-April, and I'm doing it again this year. But when I do set up, it's, it's usually kind of hot. It's like it'll get up mm -hmm. to 90 degrees and you're setting up at like noon, noon, mm -hmm. and you have to be out of the park by six. And that one is one where I will stop and go sit in my car and crank the AC so that I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't keel over. Cause like you, you can feel it too. Cause you'll start moving really slow and mm -hmm. you're just getting really like i would just feel like i was getting kind of emotional like i was felt you know you feel like you're gonna cry because you you know i'm sitting putting the tent up I'm like oh you know and i'm like this is so hard and i'm like why am i emotional and, I, and it's like oh because you need to go get some water and you need to cool down um so those are ones where like sometimes it's set up it might take me three or four hours to set up just because i have to go sit and cool off before going continuing on so so with that in mind, let's talk about your new studio. Is this going to be like, uh, do you see this as a potential as like selling art on your own terms? Like people come to you as a destination and you get to set up the whole environment yourself? Or is it just for you to well, do work privately? Well, it, so that's my, my dream is like, <laughs> so when I found, so where I used to, well, I guess I still do. I volunteer for this, uh, the Lake Mary Museum, which is a little historical museum. And Lake Mary, and there is this old section of Lake Mary. Most people don't realize it even exists. Um, and it's, you know, like all these little buildings from the 60s and the 50s um, in this area. So I was volunteering at the Lake Mary Museum, and I happened to see this, like, for rent sign, just like one of those handwritten for rent signs outside of the building, like office for rent. And I called it, and really nice, friendly woman, but it was this, uh, it's 500 square feet, and it's in a nice area. Like I consider it a nice area. It's quiet. Um, and it's, just, it was just the right size for myself and my partner. My partner, uh, he has his day job, but he likes to, um, help out with the, uh, playwrights round table and to put on shows for the fringe, oh, cool. uh, the fringe festival here. And so, and he writes his own, his own work. So he had been looking for an office. That's the whole reason I started by looking for when I saw this office space and I thought of him. And then when she was like, it's 500 square feet, I was like, oh, we could, maybe we can split it down the middle. That's pretty big for an art studio, yeah. I know, it's really big. I, I know, I'm really <laughs> proud of myself. Anyway, it's, it, we could split it down the middle. And that's kind of what we did for the first year. And then this year, I've kind of just, my, my artwork has just kind of taken over. My thoughts on it, it's big enough that I like, I, I need to paint it paint the walls and put in like a hanging system. And that was my thought. It's like, it, this is a potential of, you know, in having open studio, I could have open studios or I could have like a little group show or if another artist wants to use the space as an open, you know, a weekend art show to sell their work. Um, or even subletting out part of the space to other artists for, as a workspace. Cause it, I was used to work out of my kitchen. Um, I took over like the kitchen nook area of our kitchen and that was kind of a pain in the ass because I'd have to move everything. <laughs> like anytime anybody wanted to access the garage, which seemed like as soon as I pushed out my easel and got everything in position, that's when somebody <laughs> had to get to the recycle bins. So I'm like, yeah, and, you know, and I have to push everything back in. And 
now it's kind of nice. Like I left today to go get my kid. So like I dropped my kid off at school. I go to this, it's convenient. I drive to the, it's nice. I call it going to the office. I go to the office and I work and then till I have to go get the kid. And it's kind of, it's that piece that I think I was missing of like getting out of the house. Um, because it's really convenient when you're home and, and I, I might be the only one I'm sure it, where I will go make lunch and then I'm like, I'll just watch one episode and then like, <laughs> Oh, it's time to go get the kid. But I'm still watching episodes. So I got, you know, so now I actually work a lot more and our house doesn't smell like linseed oil. Um, like when I walk in, it doesn't smell like, you know, there's an oil painting in your face when you walk in. Um, that's been really pleasant. So I hope it continues. I hope I can continue to afford the place. Um, but, but I would like to turn it into a gallery. I'd like to be able to turn it in uh, open studios. It's just, you got to You can only do so much. Like you only have so much time. Does Lake so. Mary have a, an arts area or like an art walk? Um, where I am. So the reason I started volunteering at the Lake Mary museum is because they have their local artist, um, exhibit. So they invite, you know, they, they invite people to apply. It's, it's local artists. Um, and that's how I got involved with the Lake Mary museum because they had a little group show for local artists and I, um, did the group show and it's, it's just a quaint little place. It's like a, uh, small building but they had they used to have an art festival and they i guess they still do it's just it's not the same as it was it's more of a um kind of a buy sell uh, type thing it's not it's not as prestigious as it once was but through the lake mary museum we have the local art exhibit um and then we also do a paint out like a little like sketch paint out one day thing in the park so like where I am, I'm really close to a park. And then the, like, what's really interesting is like that area has started to get built up a little bit where like we had, uh, the brewery, we had like, you know, uh, Citrus City craft brewery moved in. And then there's been some like gastro pubs that have opened up. Um, and then, uh, I just discovered this, there's this like gourmet donut place. That's like a block and a half from my studio, which is not good. But they're so, they're so, ex they're, the, the, here's the good thing. I met the guy, but they're so exclusive that they sell out almost immediately. So mm. like the couple times I've shown up there, they've been out of donuts. <laughs> it's a good thing, but it's starting to get that little bit of like, you know, interest, um, mm -hmm. and, you know, some interesting stuff's happening in Lake Mary. So I hope to stay for a while. Oh yeah. Sounds like you're on the uh, cutting edge of a a burgeoning uh scene there does that I, make you I feel like so. does that make you feel like you should buy a property versus rent oh god no uh oh buy buy a, a space up there oh yeah. i never be able to afford that that's like no that's hugely expensive oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> i'm, I'm, yeah, I'm no, always no. like okay the artists like go where the, it's cheap then it no, becomes popular no, no. Like then the, the developers like the, take it all over no, no. Like the cheapest property in that area is, is probably 500,000, 400,000 is the least wow. expensive okay. <laughs> yeah, home. And then like the office space I'm in is nothing special. It's like a converted garage of this, um, little sixties strip mall. Um, I like it cause it has parking. I did have a client come pick up their painting at my studio and it was like a surprise for her husband. And oh. when she, he showed up, he was like, I wasn't sure if we were coming to pick up a painting or buy weed. So like, it's not that great of an area, but yeah, I was like, yeah, I don't have weed. <laughs> but yeah. So through all of this, is there any one particular person that you've been maybe consciously or subconsciously modeling your business plan after? Uh, not. So when I started, like, back if you Margaret from 2018 okay so have you ever did you ever you have the fringe down there in, in St. Pete right there the fringe festival it's like yeah, a I theater so. theater festival anyway the one up yeah. here has a visual fringe aspect of it so that you could they have artists and you and pretty much anybody who applies they, they all go up on the wall and you could volunteer at the fringe you could sit at the table with another artist and sell artwork 
And so when I did that, like back in 2017, somewhere in there when I was like starting, I would look for artists that I wanted to know because you'd be sitting next to them at a table for like a couple hours. And so when I looked down the volunteer sheet, I'd see like, oh, okay, uh, Doug Bringle, you know, like, I want to know this guy or like Chris Carr, I want to know this guy. And I would sit next to him. And so the one guy that I I got the most amount of information was from uh, this photographer. If you've, if you've seen his work, uh, uh, Chris Carr, uh, he does uh, puddle reflections, I think is his trademark. He go- He does a lot of festivals. And he literally gave me the most, like I picked his brain. <laughs> like we sat mm-hmm. at that table and I think I must have just, cause I was like, oh, I have somebody who is one, he was selling his artwork. Like he was literally selling, but totally different. He's doing different festivals than I would do, doing mm-hmm. different things that I would do. Cause he's a photographer and I'm a painter, but just some of those like practical things. Like can you do festivals? <laughs> It's it's like uh, buying a home. You're, you, you're not going to have it all, but it's really nice to get like some of the ground. Like, where did you get your walls for your your tent? Where do you buy those? What kind of tent right. weights do you have? You know, what what kind of fan do you have? Like, what's what's <laughs> something you you know? What's a what's a wall covering that you you got? Or um, how do you transport your stuff? Or like, what's it like when you set it up? Like, so I didn't model, but I got so much information from him, and he's if you go to his Instagram or he used to have like I'm on, on his, his website, website right now. Yeah, yeah. Chris Carr photography. He actually put out like uh, information about doing festivals. Um, like as beginning, beginning artist um, doing festivals. So that was, that was really helpful. So I don't know if I modeled it now. I pretty much every time, like I loved when I'm, when I did like first real festival, like my for what I consider a real festival, my favorite part was meeting the people. Like it was like meeting your tribe. Like most most of the artists are are really cool people. Um, I'm not their target audience. Like mo- you know, like I, I'm not their target. Like I'm not Chris's target audience. Um, I'm not his target audience. You know, he's not my target audience. But I love meeting the other artists and getting you know, tips and information. It's just, it's nice to meet somebody who's like, I made this crazy left-hand turn just like you. Like I, I, I decided to go this way. This is insane. I, I travel all over the country or I do these shows and I never know how they're going to be. And I put myself out there and I make stuff and put myself out there. Um, like meeting you. Yeah, you make stuff. Yeah. You put yourself out there. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. it's always it's that's really that's what really actually sometimes that can make a show, especially if it's a really bad show. Like it's a show where it's like you're like, oh my god, this show is so dead. It's nice to be able to walk around and meet other artists. Yeah, um, I've been in those situations you know, like, where you're like, I'm coming home with twenty bucks, but I still had a good time somehow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, usually something something comes from it. I've never, I've, I think only once have I, and, and and most of the time you're like, I guess you can lie to yourself. I maybe I do lie to myself, but like I think I've only had one really bad show where like I was like, well, that was a learning experience. <laughs> like, <laughs> I know what to avoid in the future, and I I can. I've been really lucky that I've only had maybe two that were like that where I'm like, oh never again. Um, never again. Uh, you know, these were my warning signs. Like, you know, I'm not, I'm not the artist for show that is, has their open date all the way up to almost the date of the show. So that was the thing that I realized, like applying to a show whose deadline for the application is like one week before the show. I'm not their target. I'm not their target artist. They don't, my work isn't going to sell there. No shade or anything on any of the artists I do. It's just I, my artwork's not going to work there. So. I've noticed there's also been a big increase in people scamming on Facebook, pretending to be the organizer and saying, oh, just send me your money and I'll make sure I get you in. I've seen that happen yeah. a lot lately. That Yeah, I imagine. I, I don't do markets so much. Like mm-hmm. I, I imagine that's got to do right. a lot of the markets because the markets are like – you're, you're doing them. We, you know, those are the ones yeah. that I don't do a lot of markets. Cause that's, that's not my, that's not where my target audience lives. 
Um, cause like the things that I'm selling are they're you know, it's the people are going to spend $40, you know, like if most of the stuff's 40 and I'm bringing out my, my, my $1,200 painting, um, my twelve hundred dollar paint, it's not going to sell, right? Right. <laughs> unless I get really, unless I get really lucky, and that was that was the shows that I realized that didn't work. And um, like I was at one where I was next to a lady selling orchids, and I was like, and and I saw her setting up, and I was like, this <laughs> isn't good because all weekend, all you saw was those, you know, thirty dollar orchids. Mm-hmm. walking past my tent and all the other artists that were there were watching it too and you know we're all looking at our print bins you know like i'm selling my prints for 25 bucks um i can't compete with the orchid lady <laughs> like most of the, most of the time you're not competing with artists like i if i do an art right. festival i'm not competing with anybody there's nobody i'm competing with but when you have somebody who's like selling stuff for 40 bucks and you're selling stuff for two. You, you're you are kind of you know, there's like okay, I, there's no competition going to go happen here. Like right. I'm going to see your stuff all weekend selling, and nobody's going to be buying mine. So like if you're ever in that situation where you have like, I don't know, it gets hard. I, I imagine it's the reverse too. Like if you had to, you know, if you're selling for and you're between people who are selling high dollar stuff, it's never that's not that's not a great situation either. So well, speaking of. Uh... Being between people selling high high, high price items, it's just terrible segue. Uh, <laughs> coming up next, you're going to be at the Gasparilla Art Festival first week of March, and then you're doing Winter mm-hmm. Park Sidewalk Art Festival mid March, and then Main Sale mm-hmm. coming up in April. That one's in St. Petersburg. Yep. yep. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I put yeah, too many okay. S's in St. Petersburg's, but yeah. So tell me about those Same three events. Right? What are you looking forward to? What are you expecting? Which ones have you done in the past, or all of them, I guess? Oh, I've done Mainsail. I've never done Gasparilla, and I've never okay. done Winter Park Sidewalk. So I never applied to Winter Park Sidewalk Festival before. Um, I live near Winter Park. I do the Winter Park Autumn Festival, uh, which is done by a totally different organization, same area. Um, and to be honest, I psyched myself out. I never applied to Winter Park Sidewalk Art Festival because I know it was really prestigious. I knew that it was really hard to get into and they're, they don't, they, I think they only take like 10 or 15% Florida artists. Oh, wow. So the one that, yeah. So the one that happens in the fall is put on by the chamber of commerce and they only take Florida artists. And the one that's put on in the spring is an arts organization and they, they, they're, they're running in, in all over national artists. Mm, that's interesting. So, so I guess they're they're kind of presenting. It's it really like hard to get into. They're curating this for the customer. So right. I guess that makes it feel more right. gallery ish in that regard. It very much so. So the shows that I've applied to do have a gallery ishness to them. Like mm-hmm. Gasparilla is a big. That's also a really hard festival to get into. Um, it's also very prestigious. It's also one that I never applied to before this last year. And, uh, mostly cause I forgot that that's one where like the application was like eight months ago. So mm. if you're not paying attention, <laughs> some of these applications can slip by and then you're like, Oh, now I don't have anything in March. Um, but the winter park one, I was over the moon. Same thing with Gasparilla. I got those two acceptances and I was like, Oh, <gasps> it's like winning the lottery. You know, like I haven't sold anything. I have no expectations, but it's like, mm-hmm. you accepted me. You know, it's, it's what people don't realize when they're walking these festivals is like people were juried in. So when you're mm-hmm. walking around Main Sale, you're walking around Gasparilla, just know that all of those artists were juried in. So they had to present their artwork and their booth. Um, they might have even, you know, written their artist statement. And that they were in a, so there will be like 200 artists, but there were probably 1800 that applied Mm. nationally, (laughs) some of them internationally that applied. And so there's a lot of competition for those shows. Um, But the reason there's a lot of competition for those shows, because they're really high ranked shows. So they're usually like, um, there are people who literally travel to only the, it's kind of like going to Art Basel, where right? it's not at that level, but it's that same idea, right? Yeah. So people are paying to be to be there, 
they were juried into those spaces um, for the potential of those art buyers who literally only come to that show. Well, congratulations on that. I'm excited about the future of Margaret Baker's art. And I'm also excited that I get to have some originals. (laughs) And if any of the (laughs) listeners want to see some of your art, they can visit you at Margaret Baker art. Sorry, Margaret Baker dot art. And you're on Instagram and Facebook as at Margaret Baker art. Yep. That's it. All right. Well, thank you so much for talking to me. It was a wonderful conversation. I feel like we could have gone on for another hour. Uh, yeah. I had to edit down the questions I had, but you were wonderful. So thank you again so All much. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. It was good to see you again. Art for Profit's Sake is recorded through Riverside FM, distributed through Spotify for Podcasters, and edited on Adobe Audition. The music is provided by Old Romans. If you learned anything useful or found this podcast helpful, please rate and review us five stars. If you want to learn more about me or my art, head over to chainassembly.com. Hi, it's Nick here. If you're a fan of my work, then I know you either like tarot, horror films, or both. My latest project is a tarot deck inspired by Italian Gothic horror films of the 60s and 70s. Referred to as giallo films, their movie posters were known for their dramatic and bold graphic design choices. I'm bringing that same aesthetic to a new Rider Waite style tarot deck that I call Tarocchi Gialli, where each card is lovingly crafted to look like a film poster from the era. It's launching on Kickstarter February 19th. To learn more about the project, follow me on Instagram at ChainAssembly or visit www.chainassembly.com.